And thus, driven from holy terror, and residing forevermore in the underworld, the sons of Horus, the treacherous sixteenth, became the Black Legion. From shame and shadow recast, in black and gold reborn. Greetings, warriors of the Imperium. Occasionally, there may be minor pronunciation issues, but I'm working to improve the quality of my videos. Patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. The Black Legion, formerly known as the Sons of Horus, and before that as the Luna Wolves, is a traitor legion of Chaos Space Marines that is the first in infamy, if not in treachery, whose name resounds as a curse throughout the scattered and war-torn realms of humanity. The Black Legion was one of the nine first founding legions of Space Marines, who turned traitor to the Imperium during the Horus Heresy in the early 31st millennium. The Black Legion, at that time still known as the Sons of Horus, became the primary instrument of its primarch, the War Master Horus, to overthrow the Emperor of Mankind and seize control of the Imperium in the name of Chaos. Such are the crimes of the Black Legion in the 41st millennium that it is easy to forget that the past was very different, and that there was a time when its Astartes and their perfidious master Horus were lauded above all of the other warriors of the Legion as Astartes, and were considered the most favorite servants of the Emperor. Born as the Ixivith Space Marine Legion on Terra, the Black Legion would first rise to greatness under the name of the Luna Wolves. Before the dark days of the Horus Heresy, they fought at the Emperor's side on Terra and through the early years of the Great Crusade. They were as stalwart and indefatigable as any of the servants of the Emperor, and their actions exemplified what it meant to be a warrior of the Space Marine Legions. Brutal, ruthless and unwavering, but also honorable, and once loyal beyond question. The history of the Black Legion is the history of the ambition of the Imperium itself, and the flaws that broke its founders' dreams of unification and glory for all mankind asunder. The Black Legion is now one of the traitor legions of heretic Astartes, who are united in the pursuit of the single purpose of overthrowing the Imperium. They oppose the infighting that consumes so many of their brethren amongst the other traitor legions, for the Astartes of the Black Legion are the greatest servants of chaos undivided. They are always brought together in great numbers to work the will of their war master of chaos, Abaddon the Despoiler, the heir of Horus. Whenever the entirety of the Black Legion is called to battle, it marks the beginning of another one of Abaddon's Black Crusades against the Imperium of Man. The Black Legion is the only one of the traitor legions to have changed its name following the Horus Heresy. The x Legion was originally known as the Luna Wolves during the Great Crusade. In honor of Horus's great achievements during the latter years of that era after the Imperial victory over the Orcs during the Ulanor Crusade, the Emperor suggested that the Legion be renamed the Sons of Horus. Horus, at first reluctant to aggrandize himself in this way, eventually instituted this change following a conversation with the Primarch Sanguinius in the wake of the Luna Wolves' inability to avoid war with the human Xenos hybrid civilization known as the Interrex. After Horus's treachery and final defeat at the Siege of Terra during the Horus Heresy, however, the Legion was renamed once more as the Black Legion by its new Chaos Lord, Abaddon the Despoiler. The new name was chosen after the Astartes of the Sons of Horus painted their power armor black in grief at the death of their Primarch and shame at their failure to overthrow the false emperor and seize control of the galaxy in the name of Horus and the ruinous powers. The Black Legion are at once the inheritors of the most glorious legacies of the Great Crusade and the vilest treacheries of the Horus heresy. Their Primarch was the War Master Horus himself, once celebrated as the greatest of the sons of the Emperor, and later despised as the basest of traitors. Of all the infant Primarchs scattered to the corners of the galaxy before the process of their creation was completed, Horus grew up closest to Terra. The world of Chthonia had been settled in the very earliest days of mankind's exploration of the stars, its hugely rich natural resources ruthlessly exploited until they were all but played out. 
Thus, Horus grew to maturity amongst the anarchic gangers that populated the post-industrial nightmare of a world honeycombed with long extinct mines and dominated by decaying hive city spires. It was from the hyperviolent gang scum of Chthonia that many of the earliest inductees into the Space Marine Legions were taken, and it was there that the Emperor found the first and most beloved of his lost sons. For thirty standard years, the Emperor and Horus fought the opening campaigns of the Great Crusade side by side, the Primarch learning at the foot of his sire. When at length the Emperor detected that another of the Primarchs was close at hand and departed to locate him, Horus was left at the head of his master's hosts, entrusted with the command of the conquering imperial armies. Horus was well suited to the task, and the lessons he had learned in the previous three Terran decades served him well. As one by one the Primarchs were united with their sire and their brothers, Horus came increasingly to be regarded as the greatest of their number, the first among equals. While many of his brother Primarchs and the Astartes legions created in their image were gifted in particular fields of military endeavor, Horus was a natural leader, his greatest genius his ability to meld seemingly divergent allies into a coherent whole. This skill was not only of use on the battlefield, for it carried over into contacts with the peoples the Great Crusade met. It was Horus's way to treat with the populations of newly contacted worlds according to the traditions of each, and this highly successful doctrine was repeated in each of the expeditionary fleets. Tragically, it might also have been the cause of the Primarch's fall, and with him fully half of the Space Marine Legions. In the aftermath of the greatest of the nascent Imperium's victories to date, the defeat of the largest Orc Empire ever encountered, Horus was granted the title War Master, Commander-in-Chief of all the Emperor's armies. So great was the victory that his legion, originally called the Luna Wolves, was renamed the Sons of Horus. The Emperor returned to Terra to oversee the next phase of the creation of his interstellar empire, but on the moon of the feral world of Davin, Horus was struck down by a malady devised by the Chaos Artifact, known as the Anathemy, that was sufficiently virulent to affect even a superhumanly resilient Primarch. At some point during his treatment or recovery, Horus was inducted into one of Davin's warrior lodges, the Temple of the Serpent Lodge, and it is likely that during that process he was corrupted in some manner that led to his eventual downfall. Horus emerged from his illness changed, and the practice of establishing warrior lodges spread throughout the legions. With it apparently spread whatever chaos taint had corrupted the War Master, and the fate of the galaxy was sealed. As the preeminent Primarch, Horus had always enjoyed the confidence of his brothers, even when internecine rivalries had caused disputes. It appears that through a masterful series of manipulations and deceptions, Horus subverted the loyalties of those Primarchs personally closest to him, while simultaneously diverting or undermining those others, such as Rogel Dorn, Robut Gilliman, and Sanguinius, who would oppose his treachery. The Warmaster's plans were impossibly well coordinated, each of the Primarchs experiencing a turn of fate, or precipitating incident that determined which side they would take in the ensuing galactic civil war. Imperial scholars have long debated how many and which of these events were directly brought about by Horus's machinations and which were sheer coincidence. Others still must surely have been the work of the ruinous powers themselves, turning their unknowable attentions upon the domains beyond the Empyrean and exerting their will upon them. Whatever the case, events reached ahead according to the War Master's strategy when he virus-bombed the remaining loyalists in the nascent traitor legions on the world of Istvan the Furry, an act so dire that five entire Astartes legions were dispatched to call him to account for his apparent rejection of all the Great Crusade stood for. It was at Istvan Faith that the War Master finally revealed his true colors. The first wave of the legions sent to confront Horus made planet fall, only to discover themselves in the midst of treachery. Faced with overwhelming odds, the Salamanders, Raven Guard, and Iron Hands, later known as the Shattered Legions, attempted to link up with the second wave, only for the true extent of the War Master's treachery to be fully realized. The second wave, consisting of the Word Bearers, 
Iron Warriors, Alpha Legion, and World Eaters turned upon their embattled brothers, and the result was the infamous Drop Site Massacre, one of the darkest moments not only of the Horus Heresy, but of the entire history of mankind. The ensuing civil war pitched the whole Imperium into anarchy and chaos. It was not only the legions aligned to Horus that rebelled, for the warrior lodges and the chaos taint in general had spread far and wide by the time of the drop site massacre. The imperial army was split almost in half, regiment fighting regiment and fleet fighting fleet. The titan legions of the Mechanicum, the ancestors of the Adeptus Mechanicus, were equally affected, and soon fully half of the emperor's hosts were engaged in bitter conflict with the other. Barely a single world was untouched by a war that accounted for countless billions of lives and that culminated in the War Master's assault on Terra itself. As events neared their tragic conclusion, those legions not committed to the defense of Terra raced through the warp, converging on the home world of mankind in such numbers that the traitors, massed to assault the Imperial Palace, would be defeated. At the last, Horus lowered the shields of his battle barge, effectively inviting the Emperor to teleport aboard and confront his treacherous Jean son. In the battle that followed, Horus was slain at the hand of his sire, his soul psychically annihilated so that not a shred of its essence remained. But in defeating the Primarch, the Emperor had suffered such wounds that only his ascension to the life-sustaining Golden Throne could keep death at bay. Even as Robel Dorn carried the Emperor's body from the War Master's battle barge, the traitor hosts began their fighting withdrawal, and in the anarchy and confusion, Horus's body was recovered by his legion. Having fought their way clear of the soul system and fled for the Eye of Terror, the sons of Horus established themselves upon a world that was at once the tomb of their lost Primarch, and a fortress from which they would launch further attacks both upon their fellow traitor legions and against the smoldering Imperium. Bereft of their glorious Primarch, the legion floundered, and in desperation turned to each of the Chaos Gods in turn, in their search for renewed power, inviting demonic possession, and the ever more costly blessings of the warp. All the while the legion suffered the jealous attacks of their former allies during the so-called Legion War. At length one such rival, the remnants of the Emperor's children, stole the body of the slain Primarch from the heart of its tomb and spirited it away, some say with the purpose of cloning it, in order to create a new and still greater war master. The salvation of the Sons of Horus came when one of its greatest captains, Ezekiel Abaddon, led an attack on the Emperor's children that destroyed the body of the Primarch and in so doing ushered in a new age for the Legion. The traitors changed their name once more, this time in reference to the fact that their armor was now adorned black, calling themselves the Black Legion. Through his actions, Abaddon reinvigorated the Legion, reviving the old notion that none could stand in their way and that they would one day inherit the galaxy itself. He prepared his warriors now for what he called the Long War, a campaign fought across ten thousand standard years to accomplish what Horus could not, the conquest of Terra and the death of the False Emperor. When the war bands of the Black Legion and their allies gather under the wrathful banner of the Chaos Lord and War Master of Chaos now called Abaddon the Despoiler, the words of Horus are ever heard upon their lips. Let the galaxy burn. You will try, that today you face the Emperor's sons and his warriors. We are the Luna Wolves and this legion is the anvil upon which you will be broken. We are the anvil. Now behold the hammer. In the time when the Emperor's eye first began to fall beyond Terra, he raised new armies to fight his great crusade. He drew these new troops in part from the forces that had already unified Terra during the unification wars of the late 30th millennium, from willing Terran volunteers like those who comprised the SV Space Marine Legion who were implanted with the gene seed of their missing Primarch Horus, like all the Astartes of the first founding. These recruits were also drawn in part from the Emperor's subjugated enemies, and together they represented the first generation of Space Marines. 
Like most of the embryonic space marine legions, the XV Legion drew all of its first recruits from the Terran population, though it is difficult to be certain based on the existing Imperial records from this lost time. There are indications that many of the Exvith Legion's early intake came from the hunter clans of the Judagran Bowl and the Samsation subplate slums. Perpetual conflict and the harshness of life on the desolate margins of Terran society had given these people the hard edge of ruthlessness and independence that would serve a space marine well. The Exvith Legion made war with a brace of aggression, perhaps through the influence of their genetic heritage or the use the Emperor put them to, the Space Marines of the Exrith Legion became synonymous with sudden and overwhelming shock assaults. To the Exvith Legion fell the swift prosecution of battle and the bloody termination of campaigns. Their attacks were preemptive as often as they were part of an existing conflict, their forces either the first deadly threat unleashed by the Imperium, or preserved to enact a final killing blow. The first pacification of Luna was perhaps the most famous of these early victories for the Exenbeth Legion, but the breaking of the Coriolis enclaves and the Five Winter left scars in the collective consciousness of Terran society that persist even now. In the Capridian sinks it is still common for traders and gamblers to refer to the Legion's ancient number of sixteen as the Counting of the Wolf. It is said that the Astartes of the Exvith Legion were unleashed to begin and end wars, their enemies did not even know they were fighting. They would come out of the night or in the dawn, carried in the holds of stormbirds and storm eagles, flanked by squadrons of escorting lightning crows. Those who witness such attacks say that the Exvith Legion were fighting eye to eye with the enemy before the thunder of their first volley of missiles and shell strikes had faded. The warriors who fought these battles were of a character wholly in keeping with their reputation. Proud, little given to humor or empathy, nor to mysticism or even the ritual of the military elite, they were a breed apart from the true human forces that had fought at their side. Their aggression was clear in their every action, but so was the strength of the control that held it in check, and the needs of that ancient age easily accommodated such a belligerent and cantankerous attitude. At some time the notion of the Emperor sending his wolves to break intractable or potential enemies took root in the consciousness of the newborn Imperium of Man, with the pacification of Luna in the late thirtieth millennium, considered by many the first battle of the Great Crusade, its apocryphal source. The Exvith Legion embraced the epithet, Luna Wolves they earned after this first campaign with relish. The wolf's head became a common icon for the Astartes of the Exbeth Legion, the link being somewhat abstract, as the Terran animals once called wolves had been almost extinct for millennia, largely relegated to existence as gene stock for engineered bioweapon beasts on Terra itself, though the name remained synonymous in most Terran dialects with controlled savagery. The wearing of pelts of such augmented canid predators increasingly marked out the field commanders and officers of the Luna Wolves. The Exvith would not be the only Space Marine Legion to bear such a title and embrace this imagery as their own, but they were the first. The Luna Wolves were the first Space Marine Legion to begin recruiting from another world beyond Terra. In this case, the new pool of aspirants was found amongst the adolescent human males, drawn from the violent Hive City gangs inhabiting an ancient former mining world that had devolved into a feral world called Chthonia. Chthonia was located in one of Terra's closest neighboring star systems in the Segmentum Solar and was within reach of spacecraft that could travel at only sublight velocities before the invention of the warp drive. As a result, Chthonia had been colonized, built upon, tunneled and mined since the dawn of human interstellar space travel millennia before the beginning of the Dark Age of Technology. Due to this unusually long period of exploitation by mankind, all of the world's natural resources had been stripped away and used up centuries before, and the ancient mining technology had long since been rediscovered and removed by the tech adepts of Mars. The planet that remained was largely useless and abandoned, completely riddled with catacombs, crumbling industrial plant, and exhausted mine workings. Horus, the true primarch of the Luna Wolves, was the first of the primarchs to be recovered by the Emperor, 
having been cast in his gestation capsule through the warp, much closer to Terra on Chthonia than the others by the ruinous powers, and he was found at a much younger age. Whereas the early history of many Primarchs is extensively if unevenly documented, the same cannot be said of Horus. Contradiction and omission tarnishes all accounts of Horus's formative years. It is clear that the Emperor did find Horus, and also that he took command of the ex Scythe Legion early in the Great Crusade. Beyond these manifest facts, agreement between the early Imperial sources is decidedly lacking, some even placing Horus on Chthonia as a foundling. Like many of his superhuman brethren, these sources say that the young Primarch thrived in Chthonia's harsh environment, learning his first lessons in war and killing from Chthonia's tech barbarian kill gangs. Another source claims that Horus returned to Terra itself. It is said that Horus grew at the Emperor's side, learning from his father even as they took back the soul system and forged the alliances between the techno-barbarian nations of Terra and with the Mechanicum of Mars that created the Imperium of Man. Other highly creditable claims state that the Emperor found Horus, the first of his lost sons, but neither source specifies where, or the location of this finding. Surrounded in millennia of myths and allegory, the truth of Horus's origins will more than likely never be known. As a result, however it came to pass, Horus was for many standard years the Emperor's only son, and there was a great affinity between them. The Emperor spent much time with his protégé, teaching and encouraging him. Horus was soon placed in command of the ex Vith Legion, which had already come to be known as the Luna Wolves, 10,000 Astartes created from his own genetic code. With these superhuman warriors to lead, Horus accompanied the Emperor for the first 30 standard years of the Great Crusade that had begun in say 800. M30 and together they forged the initial interstellar expansion of the young Imperium of Man, by the time the Great Crusade began in 798. M30. Chthonia's mines were long spent, but it had a resource that the new Imperium needed more than medals and jewels, hardened fighters and born survivors in their millions, a lean and hungry race of killers with no illusions about the horrors of the universe. Chthonia relatively close to Terra in the void, and with whom some minor intermittent contact had been maintained even through the Age of Strife, had its murderous and strife-torn population marked by one of the first expeditionary fleets to leave the Sol system. To fuel the growth of the early Space Marine Legions, the Imperium took full advantage of the bounty that Chthonia provided. At the time of the first founding, Chthonia already helped provide the necessary flesh for the Selenar gene rites of Luna, to fuel the growth of the early Legionese Astartes. One report talks of so-called imperial recruitment squads, harvesting tens of thousands of Chthonian gangers and shipping them away, chained together in the holds of prison shuttles, to the Geno laboratories of Luna's Selenar gene rites. The majority were impressed as troopers for the Great Crusade's imperial army regiments, but the finest specimens were taken for induction into space marine legions. On Luna these chosen sons of Chthonia were reborn as the superhuman Astartes of the Exavith Legion. It was more common for the first space marine aspirants to be adolescent volunteers from Terra, and later in the Crusade, after the rediscovery of the Primarchs, from feral or feudal worlds discovered along the way. Yet, after the usual psycho-hypnotic indoctrination and mental conditioning process, the Luna Wolves created from the men of Chthonia, emerged as excellent and ferociously powerful space marines. With the induction of the gen stock from Clonia, the x Legion was remade. For the Terran space marines who already constituted the core of the Legion, their new brothers brought with them their own customs, attitudes and modes of thought, the ingrained inheritances of a thousand generations of callous violence and the ruthless pursuit of survival that the indoctrination practices of that time could modify and perhaps suppress, but not entirely erase. In truth, this was perhaps the point for the Chthonians' inclusion within the Legion. As the Terran legionaries fell in battle, their voices and the more ordered military traditions they had been trained in became fewer and fainter within the X-Fifth Legion. 
The marks of change were many and subtle, not overwriting the Legion's culture entirely, but bringing a unique character to what had gone before. Examples of this change came slowly. The topknots and mohawks commonly sported by Chthonian ganger headhunters became common throughout the ranks of the Luna Wolves, as both additions to their armor and as personal decoration. After being wounded in battle by a worthy foe, it was common for a Luna Wolf Astartes to honor the valor of his fallen enemy by making a deep scratch in the ceramite across his helm's eye socket. Perhaps most tellingly, the Chthonian word for cutting the throat of an enemy gang killer in single combat, Ebethan, became a common term in the ranks to describe the completion of a campaign. The personal charisma and reputation of a commander within the Legion came to apply to the Astartes under his command, as if the ways of the Chthonian gang lords now informed the Luna Wolves' own understanding of leadership. This applied particularly to the Luna Wolves' Primarch Horus, after his rediscovery by the Emperor as his cult of personality was universal within the Legion, and all Luna Wolves came to revere the Lupercal to an extent that would ultimately prove their undoing. The strength of the Luna Wolves in battle did not change or weaken after the inclusion of the Chthonians. If anything, the Legion seemed to become even more potent over time. The Legion strove to maintain the required flexibility needed to allow them to fight any war or enemy they might encounter on their own terms, but where possible the application of sudden and overwhelming force was usually their favorite form of attack, and that of their prime march. As a doctrine, this became bound up with the Legion's savage ferocity that was born of Chthonian blood, and wielded with ferocious intelligence and the matchless tactical instinct of Horus. A star system targeted for Imperial compliance would often fall to the Legion in a single engagement. Luna Wolves warships would cut in from the system's edge, forming a spear formation that would break into many smaller blade tips to strike at the target system's planets, moons and space stations. Orbital bombardment and simultaneous mass orbital drops would break the enemy's strength and will to resist. Tactical threats were systematically identified, isolated, outflanked, encircled and destroyed with merciless precision and close-quarter savagery, which spoke of apex pack predators splitting a herd and gutting its members with lightning fury. The Imperial Army troops that followed in the Luna Wolves' wake often had little to do but scrape suddenly compliant worlds clean of the leavings of battle. The Luna Wolves' approach to the Great Crusade was direct and brutal, and their results were often inelegant if unmistakably effective. Though it proved bloody, the Exith Legion's progress was undoubtedly swift, and laurels of victory were heaped upon the Luna Wolves, and above all upon their Primarch Horus, the most beloved son of the Emperor. Time and again, the Luna Wolves would break resistance on a world, and move on to the next campaign with barely a backward glance. The character of the Luna Wolves' tenacity and ruthlessness was displayed during the initial Imperial conquest of the Soul System. They prosecuted battles with the same savage mentality and ferocity displayed during the gang wars of Chthonia, where prisoners were simply unwanted mouths to feed. War was a matter of identifying the strength and leadership of the enemy, isolating it, and then obliterating it. In the same way that a gang leader's eyes would find a rival, and their knife would quickly follow, so the Luna Wolves conquered entire star systems. Brutal it might have been, but to the space marines of the Luna Wolves it was a matter of necessity. Wars were either brutal and short, or they became long and wasteful. Driven by the energy of the Great Crusade, the Exvith Legion's methods fitted the needs of the early Imperium's rapid expansion. The Luna Wolves waged war during the Great Crusade for over 200 standard years until the dawn of the 31st millennium, pushing back the darkness which had swallowed mankind during the Age of Strife with fire and blood. Their victories were manifold, and Horus's generalship was legend, and so it was that the respect of their brother legions rose to almost unrivaled heights. Across tens of thousands of battles the Luna Wolves were rarely defeated. In every mode of deployment they excelled, whether as the spearhead of a star cluster-sized assault, or as an individual squad supporting a grand formation of the Imperial Army. Other legions, sometimes hostile to the interference of their fellow space marines, would request campaign placement amongst the Luna Wolves 
and welcome it in return. Much of the Lunar Wolves' reputation was the reflection of the qualities of their prime march. Horus's charisma and unequaled record of victories, as well as his known closeness to the Emperor, lent him a measure of respect unrivaled among his brother Primarchs. Horus demonstrated an almost preternatural talent for wielding the relative strengths of the other legions to their best advantage on a strategic level. Horus was said by some to be without peer as a commander and a ruler within the Imperium, surpassed only by the Emperor himself. Certainly he was rare amongst the Primarchs in that Horus commanded the respect and the loyalty of all, and backed it up with strategic and tactical genius. Others commanded larger legions, saw more deeply, excelled beyond Horus in certain crafts of warfare and lore, or perhaps drew greater fraternal affection from his Astartes, but only Horus could hold every view and ideal of mankind in his mind simultaneously. Even the most personally difficult and aggressive of Primarchs like Engron and Conrad Kurza are known to have deferred to Horus on many matters. You are like a son and together we have all but conquered the galaxy. Now the time has come for me to retire to Terra. My work as a soldier is done, and now passes to you for I have great tasks to perform in my earthly sanctum. I name you Warmaster, and from this day forth all of my armies and generals shall take orders from you, as if the words came from mine own mouth. But words of caution I have for you, for your brother Primarchs are strong of will, of thought, and of action. Do not seek to change them, but use their particular strengths well. You have much work to do, for there are still many words to liberate, many peoples to rescue. My trust is with you. Hail Horus. Hail the Warmaster. Though the Luna Wolves had won many victories in their years of ceaseless conflict, one would eclipse all others and see them reborn once again. The greatest of the nascent Imperium's victories during the high point of the Great Crusade came in the form of the defeat of the largest Orc Empire ever encountered. The Olinor Crusade was a vast imperial assault on the Orc Empire of the overlord Orlok Uruk. The capital world of this green-skinned stellar empire and the site of the final assault by the Space Marine Legions lay in the central Ulanor system of the galaxy's Ulanor sector. The crusade included the deployment of 100,000 space marines, 8 million imperial army troops, and thousands of imperial starships and their support personnel. The Ulanor crusade marked the high point of the Great Crusade's vast effort to reunite the scattered colony worlds of humanity. The Orcs of Olinor represented the largest concentration of Greenskins ever defeated by the military forces of the Imperium of Man before the Third War for Armageddon began during the late 41st millennium. Following the defeat of the Orcs of Olinor due to the strategic brilliance of Horus, the Emperor of Mankind returned to Terra to begin work on his vast project to open up the Aldari webway for mankind's use. In his place to command the vast forces of the Great Crusade, he left Horus. In the aftermath of this Ulanor Crusade, Horus was granted the newly created title of War Master, the commander-in-chief of all the Emperor's armies who possessed command authority over all of the other Primarchs and every expeditionary fleet of the Great Crusade. Before returning to Terra to oversee the next phase of the creation of his stellar empire, the Emperor suggested to Horus that he rename the Exvith Legion the Sons of Horus, in honor of their Primarch, and to show his preeminent place amongst the other Primarchs. Horus initially declined this honor, not wishing to be set above his brothers, and so his legion continued as the Luna Wolves for a little while longer. But Horus and the other Primarchs never came to terms with the Emperor's absence. Their hurt feelings over his seeming abandonment of the Great Crusade, to pursue a secret project whose purpose he chose not to reveal to his sons, laid the seeds of jealousy and resentment that would ultimately blossom into the corruption that began the Horus heresy. Sanguinius. It should have been him. He has the vision and strength to carry us to victory, and the wisdom to rule once victory is won. For all his aloof coolness, 
He alone has the Emperor's soul in his blood. Each of us carries part of our father within us, whether it is his hunger for battle, his psychic talent, or his determination to succeed. Sanguinius holds it all. It should have been his. During the Great Crusade, it became apparent that the Primarchs were far from the perfect specimens of humanity they were intended to be. Although each Primarch was physically and mentally godlike compared to a baseline mortal human being, they harbored the flaws of vanity, egotism, hunger for power, jealousy, arrogance, insecurity, and all the other sins of the human character. As the Imperial War Master, Horus took over command of the Great Crusade and accepted his new duties with earnest dedication. However, there was much dissension in the ranks of the Primarchs and other parties in the Imperium over the Emperor's decision to withdraw from the campaign and return to Terra, as well as to reorganize the political administration of the Imperium under the control of a Council of Terra headed by his regent, Malkador the Sigilite. Only a handful of the Primarchs, amongst them a scheming Lorgar, remained steadfast beside the War Master during this period of conflict. Horus also disagreed with many of the decrees passed by the newly established Council of Terra, a ruling body of imperial nobles and bureaucrats, which were intended to shift the burden of taxation and administration onto the newly conquered imperial compliant worlds. Even worse, Horus came to believe in his heart that he was failing his father, and was deeply wounded that the Emperor had revealed to none of the Primarchs, not even his most favored son, why he had secluded himself upon Terra and the truth behind his secret Imperial Webway project. These seeds of bitterness, resentment and frustration grew, and would soon bear deadly fruit. It was on the moon of the world of Davin that Horus's fate was sealed. This was the second time his legion had been posted to this world. After the previous visit sixty standard years earlier, the Luna Wolves had adopted the native Davenite institution of warrior lodges. Though these lodges had begun as simple fraternities of warriors, a secretive nature handed Lorgar, the primarch of the word Bearer's Legion and his first chaplain Erebus, the tool they needed to manipulate Horus towards the service of the Chaos Gods. Lorgar and his word bearers originally came from Colchis, a world defined by religious fanaticism. They had long worshipped the Emperor as a god. The word bearers had sought to spread their cult of the Emperor to every world they added to the Imperium. But the Emperor deeply disliked and mistrusted organized human religion, blaming it for much of the darkness that had plagued humanity's history. The Emperor openly and publicly refuted his alleged divinity and banned religious worship in his empire, and demanded that his subjects accept the imperial truth, that science, reason and logic alone presented the tools required to create a better human future. Lorgar did not suffer the Emperor's reprimand or views on religion well after his Destadi Simith Legion had been humiliated by the Ultramarines Legion, on the direct orders of the Emperor at the world of Kor. Angered and wounded that the Emperor would not accept his devotion and worship, Lorgar began what became known as the Pilgrimage of Lorgar to discover the truth of divinity in the universe. This quest ultimately culminated in Lorgar turning to the service of the ruinous powers of the Warp, dark gods who were all too willing to accept the devotion of one of humanity's Primarchs. Before long, the word Bearer's Legion had been almost entirely corrupted by the Chaos Gods, and Lorgar and the Desdaremi and Sebmith Legion's first chaplain Erebus were tasked by the ruinous powers with corrupting all of their fellow space marines, starting with the greatest of them all, the War Master Horus. During a battle against Chaos spawned undead on Davin's moon, whose planetary governor Yugen Temba, a former Imperial Army commander, had been corrupted by the forces of the Chaos God Nurgle, Horus was poisoned by a Xenos blade, dedicated to Nurgle known as a Kynebrock Anathemy, that had been stolen from the human civilization of the Interrex by Erebus after Horus and the Luna Wolves of the 63rd Expeditionary Fleet had made a disastrous first contact with them. Erebus gifted the weapon to the Chaos-corrupted form of Temba, 
who the War Master had left behind on the feral world of Davin, sixty Terran years before. Temba had turned to the worship of Nurgle in the interim, being transformed into a bloated mutant and killing off most of his Imperial Army garrison in the process, transforming them into undead plague zombies that the Luna Wolves were forced to mow down in waves. Horus personally faced off with the Nurglite mutant that had been Temba aboard the grounded ruins of his Imperial cruiser. In the course of that battle, the potent living metal of the Chaos Blade wielded by that plague-infused monstrosity left Horus with a bleeding toxic wound in his shoulder that his legion's apothecaries could not heal despite all the advanced technology available to them. Sixty standard years earlier, when the Luna Wolves had brought about the successful Imperial compliance of Davin, they had entrusted a detachment of the Word Bearers, under the command of its first Captain Kor Pharon, to shepherd the people of Davin into the light of the Imperial Truth. At the suggestion of First Chaplain Erebus, the ex Legion had adopted the native Davinite institution of Warrior Lodges. Though these lodges had begun as simple fraternities of warriors, their secretive nature handed Lorger and Erebus the tool they needed to manipulate Horus. Once formally introduced, these warrior lodges would infiltrate and eventually corrupt the various Space Marine legions into turning against the Emperor. After the War Master was struck down on Davin's moon, Erebus saw his chance to further the designs of Chaos. The first chaplain persuaded the sons of Horus's warrior lodge to allow a group of Davonite shamans to heal Horus. In truth, these shamans were secretly a coven of chaos cultists, known as the Serpent Lodge, that had long been active on Davin at the temple dedicated to the chaos gods they called the Delphos. Desperate to save their beloved Primarch, the warrior lodge brothers acquiesced to Erebus's suggestions. During the dark rituals that followed within the temple, Horus's spirit was transferred from his body into the Immaterium. There, he bore witness to a nightmare vision of the future. He saw the Imperium of Man as a repressive, violent theocracy, where the Emperor and several of his Primarchs, but not Horus, were worshipped as gods by the masses. While this vision of the Imperial future granted by the Chaos Gods was a true one, it was ironically an outcome largely created by the War Master's own actions. The Dark Gods portrayed themselves as victims of the Emperor's psychic might, and claimed that they had no real interest in the happenings of the material world. Magnus the Red, the sorceress Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion, had also traveled into the warp via sorcery to try and stop Horus from turning to chaos. Madness explained that the War Master's vision was only one among many possible futures, but one that Horus alone could prevent. Horus, already jealous and resentful of the Emperor, proved all too receptive to the ruinous power's false vision. The Chaos God's pact with Horus was simple. Give us the Emperor, and we will give you the galaxy. Driven by his jealousy, Desire for status and power, and anger at what he saw as his father's abandonment of him, Horus accepted the ruinous power's offer. They healed his grievous wound and filled him with the powers of the warp. Renouncing his oath to the Emperor, Horus led his legion, renamed the Sons of Horus, into worship of the Chaos Gods in the form of Chaos Undivided. He then sought to turn many of his fellow Primarchs to the service of Chaos, and succeeded with Angron of the World Eaters, Fulgrim of the Emperor's Children, and Mortarion of the Death Guard, who were the first of many to follow, along with many regiments of the Imperial Army and several Titan legions of the Adeptus Mechanicus. Magnus the Red, the Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion, foresaw Horus's actions through his legion's own use of forbidden psychic sorcery. Magnus then attempted to forewarn the Emperor of the impending betrayal of his favorite son. However, knowing that he would have to find a means of quickly warning the Emperor, Magnus used sorcery to send his message to the Emperor. The message penetrated the potent psychic defenses of the Imperial Palace on Terra, shattering all the psychic wards the Emperor had placed on the palace, including those within his secret project in the Imperial Dungeons, where he was proceeding with the creation of a human extension into the webway, 
refusing to believe that Horus, his most beloved and trusted son, would actually betray him, the Emperor instead mistakenly perceived the traitor to the Imperium to be Magnus and his thousand sons, who had long suffered from a near debilitating run of mutations because of the instability of Magnus's own genome and were known to have practiced the sorcery that had been expressly outlawed in the Imperium by the Council of Nikaya. The Emperor ordered the Primarch Lehman Russ, Magnus's greatest rival, to mobilize his Space Wolves Legion and the witch hunters known as the Sisters of Silence and take Magnus into custody to be returned to Terra, to stand trial for violating the Council of Nikea's prohibitions against the use of psychic powers within the Imperium. While en route to the Thousand Suns Legion's homeworld of Prospero, Horus convinced Russ, who had always been repelled by Magnus's reliance on psychic powers, to launch a full assault on Prospero instead. Even though Magnus had been entirely willing to face the Emperor's judgment, once he realized he was being manipulated by the entities that called the Immaterium home. Let the galaxy burn. In the days that followed his miraculous recovery, Horus's officers detected a change in his character. The Warmaster proceeded to use the Warrior Lodge present in the ex Avath Legion to begin to subvert his officers and their Astartes to the service of the Dark Guards, and to build support for his plan of rebellion against the Emperor. He had already taken up the Emperor's old offer made at the Ulanor Triumph on the advice of Sanguinius, and renamed the Exwith Legion the Sons of Horus, to subtly hint at his position as the first among equals among the Primarchs. He now moved to further consolidate his authority. Horus was now allied body and soul to the ruinous powers of Chaos, and he had a new vision for the Imperium with himself, rather than the Emperor at its head. Renouncing his oath to the Emperor, Horus led his legion into worship of the Chaos Gods. He then sought to turn many of his fellow Primarchs to Chaos. Horus was master diplomat and manipulator, and he knew exactly which psychological buttons to push in some of his brothers to get them to agree to his idea of rebellion against the Emperor. His first effort succeeded masterfully with Angron, Fulgrim and Mortarion, who were the first of the eight other Primarchs and Space Marine Legions that would follow Horus and his Astartes into betrayal. The majority of the Sons of Horus, already fiercely loyal and proud of Horus, had no hesitation in following their Primarch's lead wherever he chose to go. They secretly renounced their oaths to the Emperor and supported Horus's ambitions and his new gods of the Warp. The chaos corruption spread to every Imperial Adepta, with which Horus had dealings, including a portion of the Mechanicum, and from there, to the Adeptus Titanica and the Legio Cybernetica, eventually creating the splinter faction of the ancient Mechanicum called the Dark Mechanicum, and unleashing the terrible civil war between Loyalist and Traitor Mechanicum factions, known as the Schism of Mars. The other Primarchs Horus knew as well as any men since they were his gene brothers, and he was already well practiced at motivating them, appealing to their pride, martial prowess and courage, whilst playing upon past grudges and favors against the Emperor and the other Primarchs, the Warmaster ultimately gained the loyalty of fully half the Primarchs and their Space Marine Legions. He convinced them to first rid their legions of any remaining Loyalists during the Battle of Istvan the Thur, and next nearly destroyed three full Loyalist legions during the Dropside Massacre on Istvan Fi. The terrible galactic civil war that followed and lasted for nine Terran years of genocidal death and destruction on a scale never before witnessed by mankind, called the Horus Heresy by later generations, was the most terrible conflict in the history of the Imperium, and came close to shattering it forever. This conflict quickly became a terrible war of escalation and retaliation. The legions struck desperate blows against each other across the length and breadth of the nascent Imperium. By the time Horus had carved a bloody path to Terra, the sons of Horus stood at the head of a vast army of traitor space marines. In a battle the likes which the Imperium has never seen since, Horus's armies fell upon the Emperor's Imperial Palace, and Abaddon was granted the honor of leading them into battle. This was to be the zenith of the sons of Horus's power. 
Never again would the Legion gather in such strength or grandeur on the field of battle. In the cauldron of war, Abaddon led the first company and the hulking black-armored terminators of the Justerin into the Emperor's palace, smashing through the loyalist defenders. Their chain fists and power swords dripped with gore. Any who dared stand against them were torn apart. Everywhere, the fires of the heresy burned out of control. Titans traded blows over the ruined walls of the palace, and great warships filled the sky with dazzling lance fire, raining bombardments upon friend and foe alike. Horus watched the battle unfolding below from the shrouded bridge of his flagship, the vengeful spirit. On flickering hollow charts, the Warmaster saw his armies trapped against the inner walls of the Emperor's palace, loyalist reinforcements arriving with every passing solar hour. Through the vista panes of his bridge, he could see that the battle in Terra's orbit was also turning against his fleet. Horus knew time was running out. In his arrogance and anger, the Warmaster made one last gambit, lowering his ship's void shields so that Emperor could teleport aboard and face him personally. He was not to be disappointed. In an incandescent blast of light, the Emperor teleported onto the vengeful spirit, seeking out his traitorous son. The battle between the two great warriors, exchanging titanic ringing blows, even as their psychic selves struggled in the warp. For all his rage and anger, Horus could not win. Though before the Emperor obliterated his son's soul, Horus delivered a mortal blow to his gene father. Abaddon was climbing over the heaped corpses of broken Imperial soldiers when he felt the psychic howl heralding the death of his Primarch. Every son of Horus knew at once that their war master had fallen, thousands of warriors pausing in battle to look up into the burning sky. The news spread like a contagion through the traitor legions, and the assault that had come so close to success began to collapse. Abaddon immediately teleported back onto the flagship and arrived at his master's side in time to rescue Horus's body. With a cry of deepest pain and anguish, Abaddon vowed vengeance against his father's killer. Tearing free the lightning claw from Horus's arm, he fixed it to his own, symbolically taking up his Primarch's dead of blood against the Emperor. Realizing the battle for Terra was lost, Abaddon moved to save the Exfaith Legion from annihilation. He fought his way through the remaining loyalists aboard the vengeful spirit and cleared the ancient vessel of resistance, the mortally wounded emperor already borne back to Terra by the Imperial Fist's Primarch Rogal Dorn. Laying claim to the vengeful spirit, Abaddon and the sons of Horus broke orbit and fought their way free of the battle and escaped into the void. Horus was weak. Horus was a fool. He had the whole galaxy within his grasp, and he let it slip away. Following the dire events of the Horus heresy during the final epic siege of Terra and the death of the War Master Horus aboard his flagship, the vengeful spirit First Captain Abaddon and the surviving sons of Horus broke orbit over Terra and fought their way free of the battle and escaped into the void. A time of imperial reprisal and retribution known as the Great Scouring followed, and countless worlds were put to death by the loyalists for siding with Horus, their corpses left as a warning to others. Those traitor legions that remained in the Imperium were hunted mercilessly and hounded across the stars by pitiless loyalists. Abaddon and the remaining sons of Horus took refuge in the Eye of Terror, choosing to plunge into that maelstrom of madness rather than face extinction at the hands of the Emperor's vengeful warriors. The sons of Horus managed to reach the Eye of Terror with the bloodied survivors of the Scouring, but the once mighty Exfith Legion was reduced to a fraction of its former size. Led by only a few remaining captains, the Legion struggled with its loyalty to their fallen Primarch and the cold reality of their defeat at the hands of the Emperor and his lackeys. Bereft of their glorious Primarch, the Legion floundered, and in desperation turned to each of the Chaos Gods in turn in their search for renewed power, inviting demonic possession and the ever more costly blessings of the Warp. All the while, the Legion suffered the jealous attacks of their former allies. 
As the traitor legions turned upon one another, the dark gods subverted and manipulated their new playthings, reshaping the legions for their own ends and the never-ending war between the gods. As Akile Abaddon abandoned the legion, broken by the death of Horus and sick of war, he wandered alone into the Eye of Terror. Meanwhile, the sons of Horus carried the body of their Primarch, preserved in stasis, further into the Eye, ignoring the wars that raged around them. On the demon world of Malium, a graveyard world of steel and rust, the sons of Horus raised a fortress, Lupercalios, fashioning a mighty citadel from the wrecks of decaying vessels lost to the warp, with the aid of the thousands of slaves they had taken from the worlds of the Imperium. Surrounded by living darkness and the bones of dead warp dragons, it was fashioned from the wrecks of decaying vessels, long lost to the warp, with each spire and tower made from the jagged prow of an ancient void ship. The Legion interred Horus's body within a great tomb, where many fell into worship of their fallen demigod. Horus's body hung suspended in a spiraling chamber of bone-white stone, bathed in flickering golden light, his perfect form looking down upon his sons. Reaching up as far as the eye could see, the deeds of Horus were carved into the arching crypt walls, each one depicting a great battle or glorious victory. Each day, the worshippers would gather in the shadow of their primarch and offer up their oaths anew, unable and unwilling to find a new leader. With their primarch dead, and their legion on the verge of extinction, the sons of Horus stagnated. Like many of the other traitor legions, the sons of Horus suffered from incessant demonic attacks during the early years within the Eye of Terror. There was a never-ending supply of demons to fight off, and many fell to the uncontrollable influence of chaos, losing their mind and bodies to possession by these insidious warp entities. Some within the Legion argued that the Sons of Horus should offer their allegiance to a single power, rather than deal with the demons of many gods. Most, however, warned that the Exfeath Legion should never bow to an outside power again. They remembered too well the yoke that the Emperor had placed around the neck of their legion, and were wary of letting another master hold such power over them again. The martial pride of the X-5 legion also meant that they would never completely accept a master who did not come from their own ranks, be it the Emperor of Mankind, or even a God of Chaos. Lupercalios the Monument was a mausoleum to the X-5 legion as much as a stronghold. It was where the body of their Primarch had been interred after the Terran breaking. Few of the other legions were permitted anywhere near the sun's last bastion. It also served as a fortress from which they would launch further attacks upon both the Imperium and their fellow traitor legions. All the while the Exfeath Legion suffered the jealous attacks of their former allies amongst the forces of Chaos as the brief unity between the Dark Gods and their servants during the Heresy once more broke down into the normal state of internecine rivalry, unleashing the Legion Wars. Some captains suspected that it would be but a matter of time before they and their battle brothers were drawn into the wars between the traitor legions, and so they pushed for the Sons of Horus to replace its losses by increasing the Legion's gene seed stocks. These same captains knew that any fortress, no matter how grand, could not hope to hold back a determined space marine assault and call for more warriors to be found. Unfortunately, the majority of surviving captains were convinced that the warp would provide all the power they needed if only they could master the methods of merging demon and space marine. The wars between the other legions who had sided with Horus during the Horus heresy raged across the Eye of Terror, even as the sons of Horus ignored the events happening around them and continued to raise their fortress ever higher, worshipping the corpse of their Primarch. The Sons of Horus had remained largely apart from these conflicts. However, jealous eyes now turned their way. Traitorous forces gathered against them, and conspired to rob them of the remains of Horus, to further vile and selfish ambitions. The Primarch Horus's body, with its potent genetic information and biological secrets, was a great prize indeed. In a sudden assault, the remnants of the debased emperor's children, 
having grown vastly in power after firmly cementing their terrible packs with Slanish, easily smash their way through the defenses of Mylium and into the central chambers of the Sons of Horus's stronghold. They stole the body of the slain Primarch from the heart of its tomb and spirited it away, some say with the purpose of handing it over to the dark apothecary Fabius Bile, who intended to clone it in order to create a new and still greater war master of chaos to restore the traitor legion's unity and fortunes. Their fortress in ruins and their legion decimated, the sons of Horus stood on the brink of vanishing forever from the galaxy and fading into cursed memory. The ex Fifth legion devolved into infighting amongst themselves, giving in to dark despair or uncontrolled rage. The divisions between the legion's captains turned into bitter bloodshed and murder as order completely collapsed. The salvation of the Sons of Horus came when one of its greatest captains, Ezekiel Abaddon, returned from his dark pilgrimage in time to watch the battle from afar. It was in that moment that he saw, with cold clarity, that it was Horus's failure that had led the Legion here, to them tearing each other apart in the blood-soaked ruins of Malium. Abaddon swore that he would succeed where Horus had failed in overthrowing the Corpse Emperor, and proclaimed himself the new War Master of Chaos. Finally, sickened by how far the Legion had fallen, he stalked through the ruins hunting down his fellow captains, cooling his rage with their final screams. In the end, Abaddon alone remained of the Legion's leaders, demanding obedience from his brothers. Some saw Abaddon as Horus's rightful and legitimate successor, and fell at his feet willingly, while others simply recognized his raw strength and bowed their heads to his might. A few turned their back on Abaddon, and were either cut down by their brothers or managed to escape into the warp. With his legion brought to heel, Abaddon turned his attention to the clones of Horus. He commanded his warriors to extinguish all trace of their former Primarch and free themselves from his shadow. He then personally led an attack on the Emperor's children that destroyed the body of the Primarch Horus and all his clones, and in so doing, ushered in a new age for the ex Fife Legion. He had the Sons of Horus repainted their Viridian power armor black, the color of mourning and of vengeance, and cast off the ex Fife Legion's former moniker of the Sons of Horus. From then on, they became known as the Black Legion. Through his actions, the Despoiler had reinvigorated the Legion, reviving the old notion that none could stand in their way, and that they stood first amongst the traitor legions, destined by the will of the Dark Gods to one day inherit the galaxy itself. When the warbands of the Black Legion and the other forces of Chaos gather under the wrathful banner of Abaddon the Despoiler to unleash yet another of their Black Crusades to overthrow the False Emperor, the words of Horus are heard upon their lips. Let the galaxy burn. The long war for control of the galaxy by chaos and the Black Legion had begun. Who pledged his loyalty? The War Master. Whom did we serve in faith? The War Master. From whom did we take our name? The War Master. Who was denied to us? The War Master. But whom shall we remake? The War Master. And who shall leave us to victory? The War Master. His control of the Legion secured, Abaddon started expanding the ranks of the Black Legion, consumed by the desire to launch an assault against the Imperium. Word spread across the Eye of Terror that any Space Marine who bowed before the Despoiler would be granted a place in his Black Legion and a part in his grand plan for revenge against the False Emperor. Many of the other traitors mocked and derided Abaddon for his arrogance. However, the endless wars and corruption of the warp had sown disillusion in the hearts of others, and the promise of a place in a legion led by a warlord determined to continue the war against the Imperium with its greater purpose appealed to a great number. The insulting defeat at the hands of the loyalist Space Marine legions was still fresh in the minds of many of the Chaos Space Marines, and they hungered for a chance to spill the blood of their former brothers. Other traitor legionaries cared not whose blood they spilled, only that Abaddon could lead them to worlds where they could tear piteous screams from the dying and crush the corpses of their foes underfoot. 
The legend of Abaddon was also spreading, and those traitor marines who respected only strength, cruelty, and dark majesty already marked him out as a chaos warlord to rule all others. Abaddon soon earned an enduring reputation among the traitor legions for the terrifying vengeance he visited upon those who betrayed him. Some traitor legionaries and demonic warlords attempted to use the Black Legion for their own ends, infiltrating its ranks with false promises of loyalty. Others attempted to whisper promises in the ears of those that had sworn fealty to the Black Legion, and tried to turn them against the despoiler. In the end, the heads of all those Chaos Champions and Chaos Lords adorned Abaddon's trophy rack, their war bands destroyed and their fortresses torn down stone by stone. Eventually, only the very foolish or terminally insane would break their oath to Abaddon the Despoiler. The new war master was a master of manipulation and knew just what combination of fear, greed and vanity would sway the minds of both men and demons. Warlords would come before Abaddon merely to verify this champion of chaos and his black legion for themselves, but found themselves scorching their armor black and joining his cause. As the numbers of the Black Legion swelled, Abaddon ravaged the worlds of the Eye of Terror with his fleet, claiming more warriors and slaves for his cause. This time, the Despoiler was careful not to create such an easy target for his foes, and the Black Legion remained a fleet-based formation, slipping like shadows across the warp. Aboard the Vengeful Spirit Abaddon led his war against the other traitor legions, their allies and their enemies, creating an army to rival any force in the galaxy. Such is the nature of the traitor legions that no individual warlord could ever rule over all of them, but Abaddon hoped to one day unite them toward a single goal as Horus had done before him. The Black Legion could only hope to destroy the Emperor and his Imperium with the help of the other traitor legions, combining to brush aside the armies ranged against them and launch a single massive assault on Terra. This was Abaddon's dark dream, and the path that would shape his destiny for centuries to come, in 781. M31 five standard centuries after his retreat from Terra, Abaddon returned to Imperial space at the head of a host of traitors and demons. It was the Imperium's first encounter with the newly founded Black Legion and the return of a brutal and bitter enemy, many had thought lost to the graveyard of history. Since the Great Scouring, Abaddon had remained within the Eye of Terror, rebuilding the Black Legion as a vengeful reflection of its former glory. At last, the Black Legion and the other traitors returned to real space the first chapter in their long war against the Emperor ready to be written in the blood of Imperial worlds. Through alliance, threats, and promises, Abaddon was able to muster the largest force of traitor legions seen since the Horus heresy and took the Imperium by surprise. Worlds close to the Eye of Terror fell into mayhem and chaos as legions descended from the sky and demons tore their way into reality. Only Cadia, with its formidable defenses, stood firm, its brave regiments fighting from the towering gates and bastions of their cities. To counter the invasion, the Imperium was forced to divert many of the newly formed Space Marine chapters of the Second Founding from war zones across the Sedmentum Obscurus. The traitor legions basked in their return from the Eye of Terror, bathing in the blood of innocent worlds and filling the holds of their void ships with slaves. On a dozen planets the Black Legion proved worthy of their fallen Primarch and the martial prowess of the ancient Luna Wolves. Abaddon had chosen his generals well, and each competed for glory as the Legion tore a bloody gouge across the stars. Zagthian the Broken led his Black Legion warband in an orgy of violence and excess on the Agri world of Valicia. For his own dark pleasure the warlord constructed a vast maze of thorns from the world's blood rose orchards, blinding his prisoners and loosing them within its twisting tunnels, before hunting them down at his leisure. Countless inhabitants spent their final terrifying hours, listening desperately for the sounds of pursuit, their flesh bleeding from dozens of thorn cuts, and their lungs filled with the sickly sweet scent of the blood rose. Not to be outdone, Aralak and his company of raptors brought a bloody nightmare to the floating hive cities of Melphia. Killing millions in their rampage, 
Aralax war bands sent dozen of cities falling from the sky as he tore out their complex suspenser arrays and vented their plasma reactors onto the farms and fields below. Fashioning giant floating gallows from the remaining ruined cities, the warlord hanged millions of imperial citizens, their swaying corpses forever doomed to drift across the skies of Melfia, a terrible reminder of the power of the Black Legion. The Black Legion's greatest achievement was not only its brutal victories, but also the unity it had managed to forge among the traitors and their demonic allies. Even though the traitor space marines, demons and heretics turned on each other, once imperial resistance had been crushed, in the presence of the Black Legion, they gave grudging respect. This was the legion of fear and domination Abaddon had wrought, and it was to be an ominous sign of things to come for the Imperium. In what would become a festering thorn in the side of the Imperium, the traitor legions, often led by the Black Legion, or even Abaddon himself, would repeatedly spill out of the Eye of Terror to burn and pillage entire sectors. In the light of dying stars and flaming cities, the Black Legion would indulge their hatred of the Imperium, indiscriminately killing the servants of the False Emperor and tearing down anything they saw as a symbol of the Corpse God. During these so-called Black Crusades, whole star systems would be destroyed in conflicts that would drag on for standard decades or centuries until, as suddenly as they had appeared, the Black Legion would retreat into the Eye of Terror, their holds filled with slaves and plunder. The Segmentum Obscurus suffered terribly in these endless wars against the fallen Space Marine Legions, but in truth, nowhere was safe from their treacherous reach. This was something the Black Legion proved time and again, as it cemented its infamous reputation among the armies of the Imperium as a pitiless foe. When Abaddon ascended to command of the Sons of Horus, not every warrior of the Exmwith Legion swore allegiance to him. Many of the traitors clung to their worship of Horus as a god, believing that he would one day return to lead them and punish those who had forsaken their oaths. Others considered the Horus heresy to be the end of their subservience to gods and masters. The Emperor and their Primarch were the last overlords they would ever bow down to, and they saw no reason to make an exception for Abaddon. Most of these renegades were gradually lost to the warp, disappearing into the eye and vanishing from record, though some prospered and would return to be a thorn in the side of Abaddon. One of these splinter war bands was the Sons of the Eye, led by Drekarth, the Sightless. A former battle brother of Abaddon's, Drekarth had been one of Horus's captains, escaping in the chaos after Maelium fell. Abaddon had heard whispers of Drakarth's escape and treachery from his cabal of chaos sorcerers, who also claimed that an old ally would one day rise to subvert the Black Legion, twisting its loyalty with the memory of the dead Primarch. So under the guise of truce, Abaddon made a pact with the Sons of the Eye and allied with them during the Sixth Black Crusade in 901. M. 36 Abaddon wanted to make an example of the Sons of the Eye, a dire warning to anyone who would consider challenging his power, but he needed to set the stage for his vengeance just right, so that none would ever doubt his resolve. During the Sixth Black Crusade, Abaddon besieged the Imperial Forge world of Arkreach, offering Drakarth and his Sons of the Eye an equal share of the plunder. For solar months, the two forces of Chaos Space Marines fought side by side against the defenses of the Adeptus Mechanicus, bombarding their great forge cities from space. Finally, the traitor stood triumphant in the smoldering ruins of the great Manufactoria, dead littering the ground. As Drakarth extended his hand in greeting, Abaddon grasped it with his own, only to thrust the claws of the Talon of Horus into his fellow Chaos Space Marines' gut. Drakarth lived long enough to see the Sons of the Eye bow to Abaddon and be reabsorbed into the Black Legion before the War Master of Chaos tore out his skull and spine. Thus did Abaddon deliver a dire warning to any who dared challenge his power. As the bloodshed of the First Black Crusade reached its frenzied heights, cities burned, and worlds were stripped of people to feed the dark desires of the Trigger Legions leaving his Black Legion to continue their brutal reprisals and raids against Imperial worlds, 
Abaddon pursued his own plans. Using the howling souls unleashed into the warp by so much death and destruction, he made a secret demonic bargain. In payment for the Feast of Despair, pain and anguish Abaddon had created with his Black Crusade, the Dark Gods gifted him with knowledge of the secret location of the Tower of Silence on the world of Orelan. Cloaked in the shadow of the Eye of Terror, Orelan was whispered of in demonic lore as a place where the gods themselves locked away their secrets. Following strands of fate unraveled by his cabal of chaos sorcerers, Abaddon had discovered a concealed path through the warp and across the shifting sea of worlds beyond to reach Orlon without needing to breach the Cadian Gate. With a cadre of the Black Legion's elite warriors, each one a brutal veteran of a thousand battles, Abaddon set foot on Orlon and entered the Tower of Silence. Almost at once, the tower's guardians set upon them, ancient constructs of dark energy that shifted and flickered, their claws tearing at the ragged edges of his warrior's souls. After the bitter battle, Abaddon climbed down into the mirrored heart of Orlon. There, Abaddon wandered the massive haunted labyrinth for what seemed an age, fighting off the spirits of the dead that threatened to add him to their ranks. Eventually, Abaddon made his way towards the center of the labyrinth, where a shard of shifting darkness hung suspended in the air. Reaching out into the void, Abaddon felt the cold hilt of a blade meet his palm, and he pulled it into reality. The demon's war Drachnien took terrible shape before his eyes. After the recovery of the malefic sword, Abaddon's power swelled to inhuman proportions, and the new war master of chaos become nigh unstoppable. Whole cities were burned in sacrifice to the every hungry demons of chaos, and entire armies were torn apart by gibbering warp entities. Abaddon's power swelled to inhuman proportions as the gods of chaos rewarded him lavishly, and he undertook acts of fiendish bravery which horrified those who stood against him. Infused with the might of chaos, the Black Legion grew in power and glory during the First Black Crusade. Under the command of Abaddon, they seized ever more victories and triumphs. It was a glorious time for the x Fifth Legion, as the bloodshed and death of the Crusade washed away some of the memories of the Horus heresy and their great defeat before the gates of the Emperor's palace. However, despite the reckless carnage and terrible destruction it caused, eventually the First Black Crusade ended. Responding to the deadly peril, the Imperium had gathered its newly founded Space Marine chapters and Titan Legions and sent them against the traitors. Even so, scores of worlds had been silenced forever, and millions of slaves were dragged screaming back into the Eye of Terror. Abaddon had tested the defenses of his enemies and vastly increased his power with his newly acquired Demon's War Drachnien. He also took to using the title of War Master of Chaos, rising to claim all that Horus had once possessed. None within the Black Legion argued Abaddon's right to the title, the first Black Crusade proof of his right to lead, for the Black Legion, their first foray out of the Eye of Terror, had done much to restore their position among the traitor legions, fostering a new grudging respect for the Black Armored Warriors and their self-proclaimed War Master. If nothing else, Abaddon had proven that the Dark Gods favored him, something not even the demon Primarchs could ignore. Conflict still sputtered and flared between the traitor legions, but they now had a new purpose, something they had almost forgotten in the half-millennia since the fall of Horus. In the wake of the First Black Crusade, a time of constant raiding of Imperial space began. Abaddon was content to give a Black Legion warlord and his warband of Chaos Space Marines the chance to make a name for themselves, allowing them the freedom to strike where and when they would. He fostered this independence on one condition. The atrocities they committed must be done in the name of the Black Legion and at cost to the Emperor. First as the Luna Wolves and later as the Sons of Horus, the Exwith Legion maintained much of their Legion structure as it had existed since the Wars for Terra and Solar Unity, which had adhered closely to the Terran pattern laid down by the Imperial Officio Militaris before the Space Marine Legion's unification with their Primarchs. The smallest formation within the Logos Terra Militia, and therefore within the Luna Wolves, was the Squad. 
This consisted of a group of Luna Wolves under the command of a sergeant. Squads varied widely in both size and specialization, with the majority of the units ranging between 10 to 20 Space Marines within the Axfith Legion. Conversely, very specialized squads such as reconnaissance units, or those that might have suffered heavy casualties, might only consist of a handful of Space Marines in active service. The specialties and war gear of squads in the Luna Wolves included all of those generally found in other legions, including those designated destroyer and seeker units, who were shunned by some and existed in lesser quantities. The Luna Wolves also maintained considerable resources in terms of armor and vehicles, with tithed industrial worlds they had brought into Imperial compliance and good relations with the Mechanicum, ensuring a steady supply of munitions and materials for the ex Legion, which spent such political coin readily. Even Horus, a generalist and a pragmatist upon being given command of his legion, is thought to have adopted new squad formations after having seen their effectiveness in other legions. For example, it is noticeable that until the Lactrical Onslaught, the number of Storm Shield-equipped Breacher squads was relatively low in the X-5 Legion. The contributions of such units amongst the forces of the Imperial Fists cannot have escaped his notice. After the annihilation of the Lactrical, the number of such squads in the ranks of the Luna Wolves rose noticeably. Other anecdotal evidence of this adaptability and willingness to embrace new weapons of warfare can be found in Horus's vocal backing of the Tactical Dreadnought Armor Project, with the result that his legion was one of the first and most widely equipped with Terminator armor and at the forefront of the development of tactics for its use in assaults. The Exvith Legion showed a preference for the use of tactical squads. Squads configured in this form within the Luna Wolves, and later the Sons of Horus outnumbered all other squad types combined throughout the Great Crusade. Horus remarked on several occasions that there were few challenges of war that could not be met by, or did not require the use of such units. The presence of tactical squads designed to be held in reserve and unleashed once a weakness in an enemy line had been identified, trained in fire saturation, and carrying additional close combat weaponry for use in overrunning enemy positions, the so-called despoiler squads, shows again the dominance of the place of the tactical squad in Horus's tactical thinking. Such was the effectiveness of this tactic that its use was copied by several different legions, such as the White Scars and Iron Warriors, who field despoiler squads of their own. The heart of the Sons of Horus Legion was the company, which served as the legion's principal military division. Made up of a grouping of squads under the leadership of an officer with the rank of captain, the company was the base currency of campaigns and battles. There was no fixed strength for a company within the Luna Wolves and the Sons of Horus. While other legions codified and enforced strict limits on the size of similar formations, this was not the case amongst the Sons of Horus, which had begun in more regimented form, but had become increasingly ad hoc in structure and disposition over time. Company strengths as small as 36, and as large 972 Astartes, were recorded by data factors during the X-5 Legion's action against the Dacim Patrimony, for example. The configuration of squad types within a company varied as widely as its strength. Some were comprised almost exclusively of tactical squads, with a few support squads. Others were an eclectic mix based on the varied requirements of different campaigns and the will of Horus. By way of example, the 17th Company, known as the Hesperus Guard, had a standard strength of 205 Space Marines at the time of the virus bombing of Istvan III. Tactical squads made up half this strength numerically, with the Legion placing in general great importance on the use of tactical squads in every deployment. The rest consisted of two veteran units, three reconnaissance units, a heavy support squad, and multiple batteries of support weaponry. The elite first company showed even greater variation. Small in number, it contained two distinct sub-formations, the Justeran Terminator squads and the Cachalan Reaver assault squads. Both sported the black armor worn only by this elite company, and each was led by a captain under the overall command of the Legion's first captain, Ezekiel Abaddon. Used in combination, 
the first company exemplified Horus's predilection for precise and overwhelming attacks against strategic targets. In other space marine legions a company would form part of further layers of hierarchical military organization, variously referred to as battalions, cohorts, chapters, regiments, or by any number of other titles. Horus seems to have preferred to avoid this extra layer of fixed organization, which eroded over time in the legion, and was largely academic by the time of their transition to become the sons of Horus. Instead of a formal structure, Horus would group companies and individual units together, as required for the execution of a particular campaign. The commander of such a formation would usually be a senior captain. If the formation was especially large, then other captains would take on the role of lieutenants to the overall force commander until the completion of the campaign. These formations rarely had formal titles, but the sons of Horus commonly referred to formations intended to prosecute a rapid assault as spear tips. In eschewing formality and fixed structure above the basic level of the company, Horus demonstrated his pragmatism and his preference for waging war with careful precision. Within the Luna Wolves and the Sons of Horus, squads also commonly had their own honorific or epithetic titles rather than simple numerations. The Illuminators Prime, Deathmakers, Jerex Reavers, the First Sons, and similar appellations, while some were named for the sergeant or chieftain that led them if their leader's own reputation was strong enough alone. Many of these titles betrayed the culture of Chthonian gang honors and the tradition of reputation and internecine warfare from which they had sprung. This culture had grown steadily stronger over the years within the rank and file of the XV Legion's intake of neophytes. The exact disposition of the sons of Horus at the time of the Istvan III atrocity is uncertain. Given the accounts of the battle on Istvan III, Following Horus's treacherous bombardment from those that survived it, it would seem likely that the cold loyalist elements of the X-5 Legion represented something approaching a third of the sons of Horus's entire force. Records, tainted as they may be, place the sons of Horus at a fighting strength of approximately 130,000, 170,000 space marines in the period leading up to the Istvan III atrocity. Although the figure may have been higher, this estimate would also tally with more general assessments of the Sons of Horus Legion, being in the upper quarter of the legions in terms of the space marine manpower available to them. The Exvith Legion's Great Crusade fleet was likewise accorded to be among the greatest under any single commander's flag, with in excess of 100 capital ships, and perhaps three times that figure in smaller cruisers and escorts under Horus's direct command. Taking into account likely losses from the ground war that followed the virus bombing of Istvan III and elements of the Sons of Horus Legion not in the Istvan system at the time, it would follow that Horus began his war of betrayal with around 70,000, 110,000 space marines of his own legion at his disposal, with considerable evidence present in imperial records that the latter figure is the more accurate heavily engaged on the surface of Istvan III during the Istvan atrocity, it is estimated that some 30,000 of the sons of Horus's legionaries were dead or unaccounted for in the aftermath of that battle. It has been theorized by some analysts that as a consequence of the initial difficulties encountered with the purging of the Terrans from the legion's ranks and the unexpected cost in lives and materiel the battle had entailed, Horus was deliberately cautious with the use of his legion during the later drop site massacre. In this, it is thought that he hoped perhaps to preserve as much of the sons of Horus's strength as possible for the intended push on Terra that was planned to follow. Or perhaps he simply meant to have others blood themselves in his cause while destroying the loyalists. At the time of the War Master's advance on the Coronid Deeps, his legion's armored forces had been replenished substantially having been severely depleted during the conflicts at Istvan III and Istvan Fai. In part, this was because the sons of Horus, and to some degree all of the traitor legions, had been able to salvage a treasure trove of war machines and material from the wreckage laid out upon the sands of the Urgal Depression in the wake of the Istvan Fi drop site massacre. It was also because the war master's lieutenants ensured that, as the traitor armies progressed, 
The efforts of the Dark Mechanicum and the brutal tithe extracted from the worlds they subjugated were first set to the supply of Horus's own, above all others. This ensured that the latest and most powerful Legiones Astartes war machines, such as the Falcion and Sicarin, quickly replaced lost or damaged war machines of older patterns still in the Legion's service. As with all of the Space Marine Legions, Horus's command as Primarch over his own legion was absolute. Beneath Horus were his captains, beneath them were the squad sergeants, and where a formation of squads came together for a purpose, the informal rank of chieftain was given to the sergeant granted field command authority, a matter not always of seniority, but rather selection of the best or most suited Astartes for the task at hand an approach which fitted well within the Legion's pragmatic and sometimes impulsive approach to warfare. Beneath these non-commissioned officers were the rank-and-file battle brothers of the Luna Wolves and the Sons of Horus. This simple hierarchy belied the truth of matters when applied in practice within the Exvith Legion. Within each rank, prestige and personal reputation counted for much within the Brotherhood of Space Marines. There were distinctions between those who fought with the Legion for longer, between those who had fought in different campaigns, between those who had received certain honors, and between ordinary squads, and those who formed a captain's honor guard. Beneath the surface of this simmered other divisions, not easily visible to the outsider, divisions of blood and origin, divisions that the mere act of becoming a space marine should have washed away, but for the sons of Horus did not in many cases. These hidden divisions would eventually bear bitter fruit. The rank of captain within the Legion also held subtle variations of authority. Generally, those in command of a lower-numbered company outranked those in a higher-numbered company, while those who had once had overall command of a campaign were considered superior to those officers he had commanded during that action. At the top of this informal but very real hierarchy of Legion officers were those captains who served as Horus's closest advisors, and in particular, the first captain of the Legion who commanded the elite first company, and also served as his Primarch's principal field officer and second in command. The senior most captains comprised the Legion's Mournful, the quartet of Astartes, who served as Horus's closest advisors and companions within the X5 Legion and who existed outside the regular command structure. Before the outbreak of the Horus heresy, the final mournful of the Sons of Horus included Captains Garviel Loken, Horus Aximand, Tarek Torgadon, and Ezekiel Abaddon. The mournful served as an advisory body to Horus in both military and political matters, but in truth, its members held no formal power above that of the other company captains. Held together by Horus's personal charisma and brilliance as a leader, the command structure of the Luna Wolves and then the Sons of Horus proved highly effective, adaptable, and resilient. Combined with the ex Davith Legion's skill in rapidly concluding campaigns, it allowed the Legion to flow from one victory to another, forming and reforming to meet each new challenge. Each son of Horus knew his capabilities and the capabilities of those around him, both by given rank and personal repute, capabilities that were enshrined in a hierarchy determined by deeds rather than the demands of military or ceremonial formality. Effective as it was, one cannot help but notice the importance of personal prestige and the pack-like sorting of authority as a hallmark of the ex Gavavith Legion, and upon occasion the source of some conflict and vendetta within the ranks, a seed of the terrible division to come. As the character of the Legion was an echo of its Primarch, so one can perhaps see the flaw of the father in the pride of his sons. So it was that when Horus fell from grace, so too did his gene sons, and their faults, long sleeping, multiplied and grew to consume them. Pride, ambition, the desire to be greater than any other, and the savagery and merciless will to make such dark dreams manifest. After the death of Horus at the Siege of Terra, proper hierarchical structure within the ex Legion squads and companies disintegrated, as was common in most of the traitor legions as the more deleterious effects of chaos manifested themselves with the end of the unity between the forces of chaos. Those sons of Horus who survived the heresy 
formed into war bands of Chaos Space Marines, of varying size and composition, led by individuals known as Chaos Champions. These champions were either ranking officers of the Sons of Horus during the time of the Heresy, or newly emerged leaders who had won great favor with the ruinous powers through their violent and blasphemous deeds. When circumstances dictated, several war bands would rally together under the banner of a greater Chaos Champion, or even Abaddon himself as the War Master of Chaos Undivided, usually in preparation for a major raid or incursion into the Imperium. The entirety of what remains of the Black Legion only gathers when Abaddon has managed to successfully unleash a new Black Crusade, the overriding belief of the Exwith Legion's Astartes prior to the War Master's demise was in the ultimate superiority of Horus over all other beings in the Imperium, and, by association, themselves as his genetic progeny. In continually seeking to prove themselves as the greatest of the Space Marine Legions, they did indeed achieve the most in terms of the sheer numbers of worlds brought into the Imperial Fold during the Great Crusade although much effort had to be expended by other Imperial forces to completely pacify these new worlds after the Ixwith Legion had moved on to the next target. The Sons of Horus's defeat and exile dealt a crushing blow to the collective ego of the Legion. This has fueled the current Black Legion's almost fanatical intensity to restore unity amongst the forces of Chaos in the Long War and drive on Terra to eliminate the Corpse Emperor and regain their place of primacy no matter the cost. The Black Legion has recruited countless warbands of every stripe to their cause over the past 10,000 standard years. Though some of these still claim autonomy, they have all bent the knee to abandon the Despoiler as the War Master of Chaos, and all wear some variant of gold and black in honor of their adopted faction. Many Black Legion warbands worship one of the Chaos Gods above the others, adorning their black battleplate with icons, trophies, and the favored colors of their patron in the hope of attracting more divine favor, and perhaps ascending beyond the Black Legion to claim mastery of their own fate as demon princes. Many traitor legionaries are counted amongst these hosts, for Abaddon's strength as a leader is impossible to deny. Rather than a single force with a single leader, the Black Legion would become a mighty host of many warbands and warlords. Within this host, all would swear complete allegiance to Abaddon, and through an inner circle, he would lead them with absolute dominion. These favored lieutenants became known as the Chosen of Abaddon. The Chosen were his favored generals, standing above all others and enacting his dark will, a warped shadow of the Luna Wolves' Mournival, in which he had once served. Nowhere in the galaxy can a more feared and merciless collection of tyrants be found, always eager to put entire worlds to the sword in the name of chaos. The last recorded deployment of a full officio assassinorum execution force was against the so-called Chosen of Abaddon. These four individuals were so hated by the Imperium of Man that an entire team of assassins infiltrated Abaddon's flagship. This was an extraordinary event, for it is rare for even one assassin to be sent to deal with a threat. Abaddon learned of the impending attack and laid a trap for the assassins, slaying all four and protecting his chosen. The chosen bear an assortment of titles, reflecting their role in a past Black Crusade or honoring particular acts of cruelty for which they are infamous. Their numbers are ever-changing, for Abaddon has little tolerance for failure amongst those who serve him. The Space Marines of the Emperor's Legiones Astartes, like their modern counterparts, were genetically engineered psycho-indoctrinated warriors with superhuman abilities and minds and souls tempered for war. In addition, each individual legion had its own idiosyncrasies and character, the product of their gene seed and unique warrior culture. In the case of the Sons of Horus, the combat doctrines of this most aggressive legion were those of the application of overwhelming force directed to where the foe was weakest. These shattering blows were used to utterly destroy enemy command cadres, vital strategic support structures, and wreak terrible slaughter on the pride of an enemy's forces, often turning the tide of an entire conflict with a single, well-placed and savage attack. Even on a personal level, the Sons of Horus took this merciless doctrine to heart, 
and like the wolves they were once named for, were swift to exploit a foe's weakness, surrounding and brutally tearing apart an outnumbered or exposed enemy before they could recover from the shock of an assault. The ex Fifth Legion was a truly flexible fighting force, able to adapt to almost any combat situation. With the treachery of Horus, their gene father, the sons of Horus Legion, grew ever more savage and proud. Freed of the last remaining shackles imposed on them by the distant rule of the Emperor and the dim remembrance of Terra's martial traditions, they fought with callous, calculated fury, born both of the darkness in their hearts and shadowed powers which Horus had found communion with. Their battle tactics became ever more predatory, while the War Master himself saw to it that as the rebellion burned on, his own legion lacked neither for recruits nor the finest weapons and war gear his enthralled Dark Mechanicum allies could supply. The Legion possessed an efficient chain of command, which fell into disarray after its primarch, Horus, was killed during the Siege of Terra. In the years immediately following the end of the Horus heresy, the sons of Horus's discipline broke down completely, as the Legion dissolved into a number of competing warbands of Chaos Space Marines, each led by a different Chaos Champion, who maintained his rule through the favor of the Dark Guards, and often lethal discipline. First, Captain Ezekiel Abaddon ultimately managed to restore a measure of discipline to the ex Fifth Legion, and to bring its disparate war bands under his control, after he assumed Horus's place as the War Master of Chaos, mainly through exercising a level of fear and violence that could cow even the greatest of the Legion's Chaos Champions. At present, the Black Legion shows more unity of purpose and structural integrity than many of the other traitor legions, and only the Word Bearers Legion has managed to maintain its complete imperial military hierarchy intact amongst the forces of chaos. The Black Legion generally favors close combat over ranged firefights, and Horus's tactic of ripping the throat out of the enemy, the annihilation of the enemy's command apparatus through the use of a small force referred to as the spear tip, is still a favored method of attack. Black Legion commanders seek to apply constant pressure on the enemy in a number of lightning-fast strikes. These sharp but limited assaults are meant to disrupt the enemy and secure positions that can be used for fire support. This in turn keeps the pressure on while new attacks are being prepared. The time lapse between each assault decreases with each advance, and the Black Legion commander will usually wait until the pressure reaches its highest point. When this occurs, the commander will lead the best Astartes amongst his warband, usually aspiring champions, in a final devastating assault, an attack in which teleport-capable terminators often feature. Hordes of demons summoned from the Empyrean by the Black Legion's Chaos Sorcerers are also used for frontal assaults, and to pin the enemy in place while the Legion whittles them down. The ex Vith Legion's homeworld, the ancient mining world of Chthonia, no longer exists, having apparently lost geostructural integrity and broken apart into asteroids and debris during the centuries following the Horus heresy. Certainly the once or rich planet was riddled with mine workings right through to its dead core, as the numerous gangers that form the majority of the world's population may originally have been imported as work teams to maintain the crumbling tunnels. However, there is some conjecture amongst Imperial savants that Chthonia was destroyed deliberately by the Imperium following the end of the Horus heresy, when the loyalist Astartes legions moved to purge the homeworlds of each of the traitor legions during the Great Scouring to remove their chaos corruption. Since the destruction of their fortress on the demon world of Malium in the Eye of Terror by an alliance of Chaos Space Marines seeking to capture the body of the War Master Horus at the insistence of the former Emperor's children apothecary Fabius Bile, the Black Legion is no longer based on any particular planet and is instead stationed permanently on various spacecraft within their large Legion fleet within the Eye of Terror. The Black Legion possesses a single ancient battle barge from their original fleet, Horus's own flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, as well as other vessels commandeered or captured from the Imperium over the millennia. In particular, many of the oldest Imperial Army starships that rebelled against the Imperium during the Horus Heresy now seem to be under Abaddon's command, along with newer vessels, such as the Planet Killer, 
he has ordered constructed within the Eye of Terror over the last ten millennia. The Black Legion's gene seed, prior to the incident on the feral world of Davin, where Horus was brought back from the brink of death through the power of the, the Serpent Temple's chaos sorcerers and the corruptive touch of the ruinous powers, was perfectly pure and unusually potent, since it was derived from Horus's genome, but was generally considered the greatest of the Primarchs. However, following their corruption by chaos, the Black Legion Space Marines started to exhibit random genetic mutations, and it is likely that this taint now affects their gene seed, as it has almost all of the Traitor Legions. The regular practice among the Legion's starts of seeking demonic possession may also have accelerated the effect. However, such mutations are seen as a mark of favor from the Chaos Gods and are generally displayed with pride by Black Legion Astartes. However, it also means that the Legion can no longer produce new Astartes from its own gene seed to replenish its ranks since the Astartes organs will not properly cultivate or will be so genetically warped as to kill any human male they are implanted within. This inability to replace losses is a problem that afflicts all of the Traitor Legions and drives them to seek out uncorrupted Imperial Space Marine gene seed stores whenever possible.